So welcome to the discussion um, about digital modes of living and technopolitics um, in the context of a, uh, a conference about politics of transformation and uh, modes of living that tries to think struggles from the perspective of modes of living, modes of life, or Lebensweisen. I'm never quite sure how to translate that. Um, we also asked ourselves the question, ourselves the question of what does the spread of digitalization mean for political practice in general and for left political practice in particular? And for this discussion, we're very, very happy to have invited two such excellent speakers. To my right is Miriam Aurach, a lecturer at Westminster University and a Lever Hume Fellow who's been uh, involved in and researching uh, on and offline social movements in Palestine and the MENA region and beyond, and um, has written a book called Palestine Online. To my left is Rodrigo Nunes, a lecturer in philosophy at, this is an excellently named university, the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. In fact, he was apparently appointed by Pope Francis himself, somewhere in a big pile of papers. Um, where he coordinates a research group called Materialismus and has been involved in social movements like the Autoglobalization Movement and others, um, other social movements currently happening in Brazil for a long time. He's written a book with um, Mute um, called The Organization of the Organizationless, in which many of the questions that we've been trying to engage here at the Foundation are also taken up like questions of leadership in social movements and the like. So, um, I thought, in preparing for, for, for this panel, I was reading some um, texts about <coughs> questions of digitalization, not my, as it were, native subject. Um, but I thought, then, you know, so the, 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 the two poles of the discussion, obviously, would be, you know, digitalization changes everything, and digitalization changes nothing. And so, since I, I very much appreciate hyperbolic exaggeration, uh, I, I, I found a great text by a, co a comrade who also does a lot of hyperbolic exaggeration, Harry Halpin, uh, a text called The Philosophy of Anonymous Ontological Politics Without Identity, where essentially he argues that the internet constitutes an entirely new world in the sense of Wittgenstein and Heidegger, and that anonymous is the voice of that new world, that anonymous in a way is the becoming for itself of the internet in a political sense that the mode of organization in the internet differs entirely and completely from that, that uh, of offline, offline social movements, and that, this is my personal favorite, um, anonymous and the internet might be a source of the politico-ontological transformation of our current societal totality that has been thought impossible for so long. Now, Obviously, those are rather grand claims, and, and uh, I thought I'd start with um, Miriam. Um, since you've uh, done a lot of actual empirical research into on and offline social movements, as it in the MENA region and around the Arab Spring, um, what's your sense of this hyperbole, and do you have the sense that the, enti the internet really does entirely transform modes of organization for social movements? <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me, and I really enjoy your introduction. You're a very funny comrade. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and it's a real, it's, um, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here in a center in a conference that bears the name of one of my political and academic uh, uh, examples. Um, I think, um, these are obviously, I mean, the answer to questions like that are obviously self-evident in the sense that um, there's n nothing really new. Um, obviously, uh, philosophers have debated this for hundreds of years, but also practitioners would be uh, practical and humble enough to say that in terms of technological evolution, if there's one thing that is probably um, agreeable across the board is that every new innovation is a continuation or a partly a result of previous innovations. And so <clears throat> that in a sense already challenges the um, claim that something new created something ontologically transformative. Um, 
which bits of that new that existed before um, carries um, these transformations in it? Could we say that <coughs> the digital um, the digital characteristics of the internet that were also present in other forms of mediation already carried that um, uh, promise of a transformative uh, shift? Um, do we say that the way audiences engage in a particip participatory way uh, through the internet, that that is the um, main crucial difference? So could we say that that crucial char characteristics is also available in oral communication, where you also have direct participation and interaction? Um, so these are questions that basically try to um, refute the problem of um, basing an analysis or an essay on, the, on, on, on something like um, the idea of a novelty. And I think that's, that's a predicament in a lot of the debates about the internet. We are still in that phase where we are still, um, um, we still think that we are dealing with something that is new. And so that is, in a way, it's, um, it's a becoming, uh, it constrains our critical analysis. Because the idea, the notion of a new in itself creates all kinds of, I would say, biases and handicaps and problems. That's why in, in some of my work, I look back to earlier critical scholars and, and intellectuals and how they engage with what was considered new in their time. And there you see a lot of similarities. Um, obviously, the whole idea of media is still debated as something new. Um, but, I mean, this was a thriving d debate among the left in the 60s about, uh, about mass media and television and, and, and the transformative impact it had on, on politics. So that's why I think um, to start uh, answering in a critical manner, you need to agree what do you mean by the internet? What do you mean? Do you mean just the availability of, of, a, of a mediator of, of information that I can access? Do you mean people's involvement with the internet as a tool to mobilize or to, to voice their critique? So what do you mean with the internet? That itself is a, is a question. And finally, um, what do you mean by politics? What? What do you mean? Political transformations in what sense? Do, in the sense of overthrowing a system? In the sense of just being able to say something subversive? Um, if we don't have a basic understanding of these two major um, parameters, then I think it will only be a debate among philosophers for the sake of the debates. And it will not help me as an engaged academic who actually wants to use that debate to create change, as Mark said. <laughs> it's nice to interpret the world, but how do you change it? So I, I, I'm going to be really mean and, and say the answer to that question is two new questions. Uh, you probably think that's typical, anthropological, but I think that that, uh, that would be my answer. No, I'm just smiling because I think my colleagues know that I have a tendency when I facilitate to talk way too much, so it's dangerous to ask me a question when I'm the moderator. No, but I, have a, I, 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 would, I would give a very short answer in a follow-up, and before I go to Rodrigo, which is that I think the transformative potential <clears throat> of the Internet that, say, somebody like Harry Halpin sees is very much in, and I hope I don't, you know, betray the fact that I know very little about the world of the internets or various, in, you know, the interweb as I like to call it. Um, is the internet 2.0, the kind of usage where there's, where there's user-generated content on networks like Twitter and Facebook and the like, that they in fact change the mode of organization and that was obviously part of the story about the Arab Spring which in your work you, you, are, you are kind of critical of the whole idea of a, of a, of a Facebook revolution I think would be the, 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 the sort of mediatized term. So, in, in, in reference to your question, what? what do we mean by the internet, specifically the internet 2.0 versions with user-generated content and these kinds of networking abilities? Yeah, I mean, he, he talks about anonymous, which is a tiny f part of the web tool, which itself is a problematic thing. 
um, I mean, I, I want to hear Rodrigo's, but I think that's incredibly elitist. To start from the point of anonymous, it's elitist, it's biased, it's very problematic also because empirically speaking, we don't, we, I mean, Gabriela Goldman is the only one who did some proper research, but we don't even know what anonymous really is. A lot of videos that came out in the name of anonymous, for instance, turned out not to be anonymous. Um, I think it's really problematic um, from a critical point of view to base such a huge conclusion of, of transformative uh, promise on something like anonymous as the representative actor of a new media re realm called the web too. Um, that's not being pes pessimistic, that's not being dystopian, uh, that's being critical for practical reasons because you cannot come with promises that turn out to be futile because activists might actually act upon those promises and then find themselves being surveilled or arrested or tortured because they were told that this was a new um, political uh, form of agency. Um, so we, I think we should not project from our own political preferences and that's the debates with um, among a lot of theor theorists. The whole discussion after Hard and Negri was also you, you want the internet to be horizontal, you want the internet to be autonomous, you want the internet to be new because you have a political project, because you are against the old that you consider to be unions and working class struggle, because you have an autonomous anarchist political agenda. So you project on a new development your political uh, uh, wishes, um, which is fine. I have my projections as well as a Marxist, but I think there's a difference between that and critical scholarly analysis. But I mean, I, I want to hear Rodriguez, so I'm gonna. Right. So, no, um, um, and I thought that was actually a, a good segue. I mean, I have the sense from reading your your work that um, uh, you don't make a strong distinction between on and offline activism. In fact, you talk more about the generalization of a networking logic, a kind of new matrix of social production. Um, so how does that then transform the, the, the conditions of, of, of social movement activism, which in that sense was what I was talking about when I was talking politics, um, and also in terms of the questions that, that Miriam just raised, horizontality and, and you know, the freedom of the internet. Um, it was... Oh. It was indeed a, a indeed a, a great segue, but um, I'll I'll You'll fuck it up. I'll fuck it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, just uh, just a very short thing on the book uh, that I've just published. It just came out a couple of one month ago, I think, a month and a half. I was going to have copies here today, but unfortunately, the person who's supposed to receive the copies lives on Wiener Straße, so he's been blockaded since Tuesday, and he couldn't get. The, the package, but if you, um, you can download the PDF for free in case you're, you're interested. Uh, you should buy it to support Mute, none of the money goes to me anyway, uh, but um, you can get the PDF for free. Um, so backtracking a little bit on, on the beginning of the, the question, I think the, the, um, oh, the beginning of the discussion, I think the first thing to uh, Avoid, and I, I totally agree with uh, uh, a lot of what Mirren's just said. Uh, is what I've I've started calling the postmodern fallacy, which is the which is a, a logical fallacy in the in 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 the technical sense of going from, for example, the statement um, identity can never be fully pinned down to there is no such thing as identity. The fact that something doesn't fully exist, uh, or the fact that something doesn't exist, doesn't follow from something not fully existing. So it's the same thing. The discussion seems to come back to the question of whether the internet changes nothing or whether it changes everything. Obviously, the answer is it changes stuff. The answer is somewhere in, has to be somewhere in, in the middle. Um, it's, someone, it's someone like uh, uh, Alain Badiou in his, uh, his book on the, the Arab Spring, uh, etc. It's, 
Le Réveil de l'Histoire in, in French, The Awakening of History, I don't know how it's being translated in German. Um, he says at some, at some point, oh, you know, people talk about his, he uses an amazing word in French, these uh, fariboles of Facebook and Twitter, but, you know, in the past people used fires and drums, and it's the same thing. I, th I, think, I think it's a pretty limited materialism you have there if you're talking about two completely different uh, tools or platforms like Facebook and Twitter and drums and you say, oh, it's the same thing. No, clearly it can't be the same thing because uh, material, material platforms uh, offer different affordances there are different things you can do uh, with different tools. So it cannot be the same uh, thing. Um, but at the same time, the, the kind of claim uh, we, we started discussing seems, seems to me way uh, overstated, precisely for those reasons that Miriam pointed out at the end, that. Um, a lot of the time, the descriptive registered, it register is overlaid with a prescriptive uh, register, where you're trying to, what you you're supposedly describing what you want to see uh, in the end. So rather than describing these processes and going for the more sober option of let's look at what changes, let's look at what doesn't change. You go for oh this is this could be the beginning of something completely different. So what does change uh, with with the internet for me? First of all, the thing that Taju said it's a many-to-many -many, uh, platform or it's a many-to-many -many medium. Uh, it's not a one-to-many. It's not a broadcast medium like uh, mass media. Um, it's. Um, it produces, it clearly produces a, a, a compression of time and space. It's possible to communicate way beyond uh, the uh, physical um, proximity. Uh, and it produces a compression of time, it's, uh, which you also see in mass media today. Uh, it's possible to communicate in uh, real time or at least much faster than it would have been possible in, in the past. Um, the fact that our, the environment in which we exist is so uh, mediatized, not only by the presence of uh, what Manuel Castells calls uh, mass self-communication, but also by the presence of the 24-hour the news cycle, etc. The fact that we are uh, constantly surrounded by, uh, by media all the time means that there's a, a continuous uh, background chatter uh, which can fluctuate very uh, quickly uh, in, in special uh, occasions and like those we've seen in, in recent years in places like Brazil, Turkey, uh, etc. where you have these unexpected uh, flare-ups um, that people had been organizing towards but even the organizers themselves couldn't have predicted would have happened at that moment and in, in that way. And second, it produces a continuous schooling in the practices of both a schooling uh, or a, a, a learning uh, in the use of platforms themselves. So you start learning the difference between, say, setting up a page, a fan page on Facebook or setting up a group they provide different affordances, and with time you learn those sort of things. But also um, a schooling in network organizing in, in general. And this is exactly uh, the, the more important uh, point for me. Um, what, uh, so network, when I, when I talk about uh, uh, networked organizing, I'm not talking about, and when I talk about social networks, I'm not talking about the web 2.0 only. I'm not talking about Twitter and Facebook and, and platforms like that. I'm talking about um, uh, what I, I describe 
to try and avoid precisely the point that uh, Mirian made about uh, this uh, article, of taking one piece of the puzzle and then turning that into the key to explaining everything, uh, like anonymous in this case. I, tried to, I have tried to find the, the broader way of describing uh, this uh, phenomenon, the, the broader and the most value-free uh, way to describe these uh, phenomena. I've come to this concept of uh, network system, which basically a network system, to, to define it very schematically, is uh, a system of different layers. So you have the layer of uh, social networks, of actual flesh and blood individuals in, in the material world. You have the network uh, on Twitter, which is not superposable, is not exactly the same. Uh, because you interact with different, different people because uh, not every individual that is in one layer is in the other layer and vice versa. Uh, the Facebook uh, layer, the mass media layer, the layer of physical spaces, all of these layers being networks, the parts of which are also networks. Um, and I think this allows you, on the one hand, to describe something uh, like anonymous, so anonymous itself can be thought as uh, a network system because what is anonymous? On the one hand, it's just this name that anyone can reclaim. On the other hand, uh, there are, over the years, more tightly knit uh, collectives uh, have uh, developed that usually, uh, that have tended to initiate more actions as, uh, as anonymous. Then there's uh, a few individuals who, because of their technical skills, etc., or simply because of the network, uh, the, the botnet that they control, so the, the networks of remote computers that they, uh, where they have installed uh, software that allows them to control those remote computers for um, uh, denial of service uh, attacks. Um, those, those individuals have way more uh, weight in, in uh, would have way more weight in anonymous. So you have all these different layers of networks, of all of which go by the name anonymous. And at the same time, anonymous belongs within a much broader uh, network system of, of movements and, and collectives and networks in the broadest sense. Uh, Etc. I think you're trying to, I'm trying to interrupt me. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll let you. That's cool, thank you. Um, no, I, uh, because I wanted to, I want to come back back to your conceptualizations of of what these very sort of nested networks mean for questions of leadership and organization in a moment. But I wanted to uh, go back to Miriam for a second because one thing that you argue quite explicitly uh, in one of your texts is. Um, that the, quote, the internet is not non-hierarchical, but embedded in structural inequalities and the strong privileges, privileges of some existing media over others. And um, later you argue that the internet is very much shaped by um, the dynamics of imperialism and neoliberalism. And um, <clears throat> obviously this then, then feeds onwards into the tools that are being used you know, who designs Facebook and Twitter, where do they come from? So in that sense, the, um, in a way, I have a sense that I'm sitting between sort of two materialisms. I think there's a materialism of the network analysis, and then there's a sort of uh, more classical historical materialism, and I just want to sort of relate them to each other. How would you respond to the kind of network system analysis that Rodrigo has just outlined? Um, yeah, I think it's very, uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to reading Rodriguez's uh, work. Uh, I benefited a lot from uh, Ulysses Mejia's uh, work on uh, his critique on the, the theory of networks and, and nodes, the idea that the internet, the innovative Im, Im, uh, impact of the internet it, is that it, it's formed and organized around these nodes that collect different uh, groups and networks. And his idea that that that's interesting and important, but of, obviously the majority 
uh, of people of the world is organized around power nodes. Actually, no, neither nodes nor, uh, nor, nor nothing, because you, you can't uh, discuss or analyze any part of society uh, anymore without including the role of the internet. It is part of our hegemonic real uh, life form of organism. Um, so, uh, so that would be my, my response to the, the issue of, of uh, networks. I, I think, I mean, I agree that um, it's important to specify at which point, which level of analysis one is trying to intervene. As long as that is clear and as long as it doesn't exclude general power relations, all uh, forms of scholarly analysis are really important and, 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 and fine, and in fact need to be um, made stronger and increased. Because I think if you zoom out from the field, you will find that critical analysis are actually still the minority. The majority of analysis and scholarly produced knowledge is very mainstream and, and really buys into the neoliberal lie of, uh, of the importance of, uh, of, of uh, new media. And I think this exposes a problem between, um, I, I, I'd like to distinct between organic intellectuals and critical academics. It's not the same. I mean, even among critical academia, you will have a strong tendency to glorify or to emphasize certain parts of the processes. Because, and it's hard to acknowledge as academics who are uh, new and upcoming in a time where you know neoliberalism is breaking down all the institutes and, 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 and financial support systems. And, and we need to say that, although it's really hard to acknowledge. Um, you need to publish, you need to have a book, you need to have articles in peer-reviewed journals. And we know that the, 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 the theoretical mainstream parameters, parameters of those create journals are not critical, they are very mainstream. And so what we do is we create our own uh, paradigms, we recreate these um, conservative paradigms because there's no space in that field. And I think that we have to ask the question, why have so many books and articles come out after 2011 about the, the role of the internet in protest movements? Um, it's part of my job as well, and it's part of what pays my rent. But we need to be open as critical academics. Uh, and I think I, I quite appreciated Christian Fuchs' critique of Castell's new book on the, uh, what was it, outrage, um, what was the title? Of yeah. Um, basically, like, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> why, why would you want to actually have a book within 12 months of these enormously important transformative developments that we are still grappling to understand, uh, uh, being, uh, you know, rolling out of the printers uh, to claim that the, the, the role of networks and, and internet was imperative, why? So um, I'm obviously exploiting this opportunity uh, of an intellectual debate to actually also throw that back and to, and to you know, acknowledge that a lot of the, the produced knowledge on, on, on what is happening is creating these biases. So I really am not against analyzing anonymous. I think it's really important to do that in a critical way. But I think it says something about the types of actors and, and forms of interactions in the world of internet activism that we focus on and try to decipher. Um, and I, I, I would... I would want to. De I would want to, in any case, de demystify that uh, by going to the activists themselves and ask what they're doing, <laughs> and the result is often disappointing for internet-focused researchers because what you find is that the most active and vocal activists are often the ones who are the most cynical about the impl implications of the internet. Hussam al-Hamalawi, Ala Abdul-Fattah, Gigi Ibrahim, people in Egypt who are the 
faces of the Facebook revolution or the online revolts are actually the most dismissive when it comes to the debate about the role uh, of the internet. Um, and why, and that's my last point, why is that the case? That's not because they're anti-technology or conservative. On the contrary, they're usually the ones who are in the tech, Arab techies who develop those alternative tools uh, and software. Why that is, I think, is because it takes away the agency in part of the social movement and social transformations that is the most difficult to achieve, that pays the highest price. It takes away the agency of human beings who sacrifice their jobs, their careers, their lives, their relationships, their families, to create political change. And by inserting technology as an important factor of that change, it sort of, it sort of it takes away uh, the, the agency where it belongs. And I think what we would be really good is to create that dialectic link to say, actually, um, technology and internet has proven to be of incredible importance at this particular instance, which is why I, in that same article you quoted, propose to see these changes through a matrix, to see them through the difference between the internet as a tool, as a simple tool of survival, and a space where you archive your experiences and revolutions, and to see those two dynamics in different stages of political change. In the preparation of a revolution, the power and influence of what we're discussing is really different from the period of a post-revolution, where it's saturated, where the state already knows what you're doing and has copied your strategies and tactics and is using the same things against you, and where mobilization has already trespassed the tipping point. Those different faces of political radical transformations determine, I would say, even though it sounds conservative, determining how you define and qualify that, uh, how do you say that, the, the, the consequence and the role of what we're discussing. Um, and, the and the conclusion, I'm afraid, at this point, at least from my research, the Arab world is not so positive. I'm, I'm afraid we are actually now going through a counter-revolutionary period where all of this is actually turning to be more and more against radical progressive political change. So in a few years we're going to have a con conference about <laughs> the, the terrible ro role of the internet <laughs> in the, the social movement. Of prevented revolution. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I, I um, maybe later I'll I'll, uh, I'll come back with a with a question regarding the. Um, Sort of the boosterism of the new, and I was going to try to do this old move where you always go back to another authority and say, well, you know, Marx studied only yeah. a set that was only 5 to 7% of the population, which yeah. I think the, the number that Thomas shared with us yesterday. But on this question of what's the, as a way, what are the lasting impacts on, on left strategy and social movements? Because you just sort of, as you said, used some fairly conservative notions of like revolutionary and post revolutionary situations. Um, I, I want to sort of stay with that a bit because that brings us to the, to the question of strategy, which I, which I think is very important. And I think in your work you do something very interesting um, yeah, with the categories, with the central strategic categories of uh, leadership and vanguardism. Mm. And you say that they actually are transformed in this new networking paradigm. And, and maybe spend a bit of, you know, take some time to actually explain that because I think that's a really, really interesting aspect of, of, of the work that you've done. Yeah, I mean, the, the going back to to the the, the question um, before, I I wouldn't see you know I, we we were as we were discussing before starting uh, the session, you you suggested that uh, my take on on networks was uh, Latourian, and one of the reasons why it's not Latourian is precisely that Latour sees uh, network theory as incompatible with something like uh, Marxist uh, analysis, whereas I don't. Basically, what I'm trying to do, uh, the network theory that I'm, I'm trying to work from is a lot more um, the mathematical knowledge about networks, so graph theory, 
and uh, the physical knowledge uh, about networks, um, which is the most rigorous, value-free uh, knowledge uh, or debate we have on, on these issues because it's not like the, the appropriation of that discussion for uh, political ends. Uh, so what I'm trying, I always describe uh, by virtue of a, a um, professional vice, um, what, what I do is mostly ontology. Um, sorry. Um, I always describe ontology as writing code, you know, as in, you know, writing uh, software code. You, you, you define what kinds of objects must uh, exist in, in, a, in a discourse. So I'm trying to describe that very basic, most basic level at which there is no distinction, there is no um, uh, relevant distinction between the internet and uh, outside uh, the internet, although describing the interaction between the two is, is an important thing as well. And the point is, even at that very basic level, uh, the idea that networks are by nature non-hierarchical is simply wrong. Mm. The, the mathematical and physical knowledge that we have on the subject mm. points to exactly the other, um, the other direction, uh, which doesn't mean, again, we, shouldn't, uh, we should avoid the postmodern fallacy of going, oh, so they're not non-hierarchical, then they must be evil. No, they're, they're neither good nor bad because nothing in the universe actually cares about what we think about it, um, thankfully, for the universe. Um, but the, 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 the question is, uh, once, once you actually uh, analyze the, 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 the network systems uh, that have been produced by events such as uh, the... The, the uprising in Tunisia, in Egypt, 15M in Spain, Occupy, etc. The, uh, the 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 one in Brazil last year, uh, etc. Once you look at those, you'll actually see that rather than corresponding to this uh, ideal which is projected onto them of uh, absolute flatness, perfect horizontality, etc., etc., they're much more accurate accurately described as, uh, rather than decentralized, distributed movements uh, which are characterized by distributed leadership. So what's a distributed, uh, distributed movement? It's not one where every, um, it's neither one where there's only one central node that everything is connected to, neither is it uh, one where every node has exactly the same weight mm. in the network. Uh, it's one where you find uh, what is technically speaking a power law distribution. People will know this from economics, for example, as the Pareto, Pareto distribution. Yeah, the Pareto, Pareto distribution, yeah, 80-20. Distribution. It's actually, uh, uh, or you might. Uh, right. Um, you might also know this as uh, Robert Mitchell's um, Iron Law of Oligarchy. Um, so that's roughly 20% uh, of, of the nodes will have, in a network, will have 80% of the connections. And then you have what is called a long tail. Uh, which drops very quickly, but then uh, continues very uh, asymptotically approaching zero. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, uh, of um, an increasing number of nodes with a decreasing number of, uh, of, of ties. So basically, you have a distribution where uh, it's not one central node, but a few uh, central uh, nodes. A few nodes are more central than others. These are called hubs. Um, at the same time, so one kind of leadership 
which you could describe uh, as leadership as, uh, as potential. Why? Because remaining a hub, maintaining your connections, uh, depends on uh, the quality of the work that you're doing. If you start routing uh, bad information or if you start, uh, you know, if you start an initiative that is a complete dead end and leads the, the movement in, in a bad direction, you will probably lose some of that uh, capital that you have as a hub. So that, uh, that would be one kind of leadership as it uh, appears in a distributed leadership, uh, a system characterized by distributed leadership, uh, hubs or leadership as potential. But on the other hand, to compensate precisely the uh, lack of balance that you find uh, with that power law distribution, uh, that the fact that you have a few hubs and a much, uh, and a much greater number of non-hubs or smaller nodes. To compensate for that, you have what I call leadership as event, uh, which I, for which I have given the name of Vanguard function. Uh, what this means is that a, a, a system characterized by distributed leadership is not leaderless, it's actually leader full. It has many leaders and um, there is the possibility that at some time, at some point, someone uh, who was not uh, a group, an individual, whatever, who was not a hub previously, who was, not, uh, who was never appointed as a leader and who wasn't even known, might start an initiative that will, for a moment, attract the, um, uh, the attention and the collective action of the system. So this I call the Vanguard function uh, to, to differentiate it from uh, the Vanguard in the Marxist sense. No one is by divine or historical right a, a, a Vanguard. This could happen anywhere within uh, uh, a distributed system, which is what compensates uh, the, the, the inequality uh, of the, the, the power law distribution by making it possible that new leaders can emerge and that the, the leadership function will uh, circulate around uh, the system. Um, but it is in that sense, it, it is in that sense then that you can speak of uh, horizontality and democracy. There is no absolute horizontality, even though horizontality can be useful as a principle uh, to work towards, even though you know that you're not gonna arrive at it. Um, and on the other hand, a distributed system is neither a, a, a perfect market, an ideal market of ideas and initiatives, it's slanted towards hubs, um, but at the same time, the fact that leaders can uh, appear anywhere and the fact that you're a leader to the extent that you lead, to the extent that you're doing something that other people are following, uh, gives you the measure in which we could uh, apply the, in a very literal sense, the Zapatista motto of mandar obedeciendo, to, to rule by obeying, to these distributed systems. You, you rule by obeying because you only lead to the extent that people follow what, what you're doing. Okay, I'm going to go back to the podium with um, two more short points to, towards Miriam. The first was actually picking up on what Mario said. In your, in your empirical research, um, how, how did you find, and since you looked at these, these uprisings very, very closely, like, did you find the pattern that Mario described, that there was a sort of early you know, upsurge of internet-based activism and then, and then things sort of moved back into, let, let's call it more traditional forms of practice. And then the slightly um, nagging question that, that, that struck me um, at the beginning of your talk when you said, well, you know, anonymous is this tiny sliver of, of, of what happens on the internet. And I think the, um, the argument of a sort of internet booster like Harry Halpin would be, of course this is a very small point 
of the internet, but it encapsulates something, a kind of tendency. Uh, is what the Italians call it, the law of the tendency or something like that. that there, you actually look at, you know, it's always this, this kind of trope in, in some critical analysis. And again, you, would, you could refer it back to Marx who spoke about the industrial proletariat, which was a tiny, tiny fraction of the societal composition at the time. And hadn't, in fact, you know, industrial production had not yet structured all of society, which it probably came to whatever in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Nonetheless, his critical and strategic analysis focused on this very, very small portion of what was happening in the productive sphere. And he said, look there, because that's where the transformative potential is going to come from. And if Harry, you know, with his hyperbolic sentence of the long-desired political ontological transformation of current social totality that has been thought impossible for so long, I just thought it's such a, it's such a nice phrase. The, long-desired political ontological transformation of current social totality that has been thought impossible for so long. So nicely poetic. He could say, well, of course it's small yet, but there is a potential here, there is a different ontology there. And so, maybe you want to start, and then we go back to the... I mean, um, the, 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 the fact uh, of life is that uh, it's not about majority versus minority or masses versus vanguards. I mean, revolutions are always, the, the whole point of revolutions that we need to acknowledge, even though it's slightly undemocratic, is that they are made by minorities. It is, it is, a, a, it is a, something that, we, oh, that I accept uh, uh, as, a, as a revolutionary. Uh, there is, representation and, and democracy are not the same. So I, point taken, if anonymous is the, the point of intersection where things are clarified most, most obviously, f sure, we should analyze and deconstruct that, uh, although I would say I don't think it is the most. Uh, it is the most mediatized. That's what I was saying about this whole thing of organic, intellectual, critical academic. It is the most appealing example because it relates to what a lot of people understand and have seen. Uh, it's very accessible, it's on YouTube, uh, it's, 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 I mean, there's a lot of stuff written about the rituals of Anonymous, the, the Viva Vendetta, the mask, it appeals, it's very, you know, and that's good, I'm, I'm really for, I'm really for opportunism. When opportunism is good and it, it relates to, you know, uh, our side winning, I'm fine. But on an empirical point of view, I think actually, uh, the, uh, uh, a more elite, elitist example is Twitter, which I think is more relevant to analyze um, from a different level. It's probably not the same analysis as a media anthropologist would do because it doesn't have the same visual impact as Anonymous has. But I think the fact that Twitter is also, it's an enormously tiny group. <laughs> it's, I think at the peak of the, of the movement in the Arab world, it, was, it didn't count more than 3% of the overall uh, activist population. Um, but I think in terms of what it can tell us about this ontological shift, whatever we mean by that, is that it encapsulates something really important and that is related to the infrastructure of Web2, the ability to have mass communication uh, and avoid state censorship and be able to avoid um, media editorial biases and relates to a group of people Instantly, the whole thing of David Harvey's um, uh, point about the era of globalization, meaning the collapse of time and space. I think Twitter shows that. It's very elitist because it it shows this between a group, a small group of people that uh, you know that already probably know each other anyway, because the group of activists that are online known, their identities known online, are usually also people who know each other offline in a certain setting. Having said that, uh, that is relevant at a certain stage of political change. And it's less relevant in another phase of political change. And if you already say that, if you already acknowledge that, it, it depends on, 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 on a moment in history. How valid is it to make such huge claims about determining uh, uh, the, the, the determining change of the internet. If you already start to deconstruct it and say it's actually not really um, as valid or important in, uh, in the face within just five years, 
then how really valid is to make such a big philosophical claim? And again, that is not, it's not rejection. It's not, uh, I think determinisms are really just a way to avoid critical debate, to be honest. It's really, a, it's just a very nice way to avoid going to the core, where does it help and where doesn't. What I uh, try to argue in another piece, I think it would be, and that ties to what you said, um, it's really interesting this idea of nodes and, and, uh, and hubs. But I think that we need to also say that nodes and hubs are, happen both offline and online, and that the, the, the idea is where, where, it di where they dialectically meet and create a certain crystallization is where you can talk about political change. And to be honest, I think Rosa Luxemburg made a, a really interesting point, what she calls uh, uh, period, periodic fertilization where class struggle and political struggle, where they intersect, it's where they have the most important uh, impacts. We can use this metaphor and say this periodic fertilization of class and political struggle to, to, to outlay it on the, on the debate of, of, of digital change, where the offline and online intersect at a certain time, the best part of the online strong capacities of those networks or nudes, where they intersect with the offline, that's where you see something fascinating happening. Um, and in the context of uh, the Arab world, I call this synchronization. And it's a dual synchronization. It's the online and offline synchronization. Um, and it's the online media and mass media synchronization. And we've seen that the impact of the internet would really have been very different if it wasn't for Al Jazeera. If Al Jazeera, the satellite network, did not become the megaphone of those Twitterers and Facebook activists, the online, we would have been having a different discussion. And here I come back to the matrix. That's why it's important to talk about historical timing. If Al Jazeera was not ideologically allied with the Ikhwan, uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood, who were in the opposition in the Arab world, they would not have performed that role as a megaphone. In the post-revolution, in the, in the counter-revolution, or in the phase just after the peak, where the Ikhwans were elected, the Nahda in Tunisia, um, the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Islamists in Morocco, that synchronization really not collapsed 100%, but decreased enormously because the political synchronization was gone. So Al Jazeera started to play the negative megaphone of the online activists. And that's why I think historical materialism and historical uh, analysis from a material perspective is really helpful, not only as an intellectual, um, how do you call it, uh, uh, work, job, uh, endeavor, but also politically, because it's, we're talking about uh, serious stuff here, and, and if we produce communiques and, and, and uh, texts that are claiming otherwise, we, we are complicit, we create, an, uh, we produce a knowledge that is not um, reflecting the power dynamics. And so what does this mean for activists who read those texts? They get a wrong impression of the power dynamics. They invest in something that could lead in their own defeat. That's what I meant by being an organic intellectual means that you have to also say, okay, shit, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't really reflect what I'm supposed to be saying as an academic in, in this journal, but the truth of the matter is that counter-revolutionaries are stronger on Facebook than revolutionaries. So it's a negative node, it's a negative hub. It's not a, 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 a node or hub that reflects optimism and, um, yeah, I have more to say, but I think that's my, my initial, coming from the field where we do experience now a moment of extreme pushback and counter-revolution. I mean, last week I spoke to an activist in, in, in Tangier who was abducted from the streets and uh, uh, abused, intimidated, and then thrown back so that the regime could give the message to other activists 
This is what can happen to you. This would not have happened two years ago <laughs> when the movement was on its peak, when it, they were shouting against police officers, they were cursing their mothers. And now they're being abducted. What is this saying? What is this saying in terms of the time we're at? And I think that maybe starts to answer the question why a lot of activists are becoming increasingly annoyed and frustrated by the debate about online politics. Because they, they have these debates, abstract theoretical debates, and then they go home, and then their friend calls them, we need to go to the police station <laughs> to demand the release uh, of our comrade. So that's what I want to bring in. Uh, I'm learning a lot from philosophical analysis, but I also want to give back some of the anthropological empirical realities that might dialectically <laughs> produce a different uh, type of, of analysis, at least in terms of the hubs and nodes being just as well representations of the state, political hubs and nodes of global capital, of the muhabara, the surveillance systems, etc. Do you agree that it's that it's not that that you're that it's not normative, that you, you don't mean it in a normative way, mm -hmm. that it's just a sort of mechanic, um, mechanistic, uh, mechanical uh, level of seeing uh, how the world is organized, that they could just as well be nodes and hubs of state security. Yeah. Um, I think that is the beginning of a way to sort of push back against this. You know, lovely. Text, actually, but <laughs> actually, there is there. I I find there is a, a really funny paradox in like the 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 political imagination of which anonymous is the most visible part, which is you know people look at V for Vendetta, and see a story of a revolution of how a revolution can happen spontaneously by everyone coming together, and it's like you you actually haven't seen the film. <laughs> it's the story about one guy who works for I don't know how many years on his own um, to to organize a, a revolution, and he does it very well because he he has got near superhuman powers and and stuff. Sadly, we don't we don't have that to fall back on. He lost. Um, no? Sorry. And he lost. I mean, that's the crux. Well, and he. And, and, and he doesn't, yeah, he, do, he only wants, to, also his objective is purely negative. He only wants to bring the government down and then die. So he, um, you know, it's not actually a really good organizing model, I'd say. Um, plus, people haven't understood the film. Um, but I'll go, I'll go back, I'll, I'll work from, from, the very, um, from the very starting point, which is the, the, the question about the, the definition of network, mm -hmm. and then try to make my way back up to, to where um, Miriam just ended. Um, so yeah, the definition of, um, the, de the, uh, the definition of network is, uh, it, uh, defining a network is pretty much the same thing as defining a set, a mathematical set. So if you think of any two things, and literally any two things that you, you think can belong to the same set, whatever, I always like playing that game with students. Think of whatever two things as unconnected as they can be, and ultimately, they at least belong to the set things that you just thought. So, you know, anything can, any two provided Provided you, you provide a definition of what counts as a node um, and what counts as a tie between nodes, any two things can be uh, described as uh, a network. Actually, any one thing can be described as a network. It's just a, net, a network that has only one node um, with, with ties to itself. Um, so... So this, so this means, so this means that when I'm talking about networks, I can be talking about anything from people in a room, from a political party. A political party can be described as a network. A, a trade union can be described as a network. It will have a different network topology uh, if you compare it to a loose network, but it can be described as a as a network. Uh, as well, and and you can and you can describe or you can identify the ways in which the the formal 
uh, structures that regulate the functioning of the party or the trade union uh, produce a certain kind and reproduce a certain kind of uh, network topology, but a party, a union, etc., is a network and a network that belongs to several, that is a part of several other um, networks. And I'm above all not talking about only the internet. What the internet does is provide us uh, very helpful visualizations of networks um, because you can, you can extract data and produce those graphs that I'd love, I love looking at uh, of Twitter interactions and Facebook interactions. Each one, like you, so, and each one of these networks is a network in itself. You can't superpose the Facebook network on the, on the Twitter network, let alone superpose those two on, on the streets. It's different, there'll, there'll be collective accounts, uh, there'll be individuals who are far more active, say, in Twitter, they're on the streets. Uh, a lot of the people who do uh, ground organizing uh, won't be as active in, uh, in social media because they just won't have the time. Uh, and so on and, and so forth. And every other term I'm using, uh, node, hub, Vanguard function, uh, this can apply to all, all, anything that you decide to define as a network from you know, atoms to global capitalism and beyond, um, the so solar really system, et cetera. So, so basically, if I understand this correctly, it would be conceptually wrong to say there are networks and there are organizations. Like organizations like the left party are merely, if you have a sort of network ontology, they're merely a form that a network takes. Exactly. There is in fact, I'm, I'm just sort of trying to you know, follow on from. There is another corollary of, uh, of that, which is there is no such thing as no organization. This is why the book is called Organization of the Organizationalists because people who don't have formal organizations are still organized in a way that can, that can be described. There simply is no absence of, of organization. Um, this means that in, in, a, in, in a network, what I call a, a network system, you have a number of, uh, of options, of, you, a number of, uh, of potentials that you can activate, uh, that you can, um, that some people can uh, consciously decide to activate, deliberately decide to activate, or that can be activated uh, sort of spontaneously. Another, another thing that follows from the idea that there's no such thing as the absence of organization is that there is no such thing as spontaneity as such, because the spont spontaneity is the production of, is the spontaneous production of organization. Um, but so these, all these potentials, uh, so what, what are the potentials that can uh, be activated in a network system? There is forking, uh, which, is one, which is one option. Uh, the moment, the, the term is taken from uh, uh, software development, where uh, the, the, the process of developing a piece of software uh, the group who were working on a piece of software disagree on the direction that the software must take, so it becomes two separate projects. That's called forking. It could be swarming, which back in the days of the anti-globalization movement was understood as the only potential that network systems had, and it was used as the, the panacea uh, that back then it was the, the, the thing that was going to save the world was swarming. It could be distributed action, which is different from swarming. Swarming means everyone converging on the same point at the same time. Distributed action means, uh, say, you, you're, gonna, uh, you're, you're attacking a bank and you organize actions in several different cities uh, on the same day to, to target that one particular bank. It could be formalization, i.e. the development of formal structures, and it could be the party. I, I actually feel vindicated by uh, the success of Podemos in, in Spain 
uh, because I, I, I wrote the book before the, the elections in Spain, and I, and I, I say even parties, and if, if a party is going to appear, it's going to appear out of the existing networks that have been created by, by these movements, and, and hence Podemos. I'm going to ask you to stop. You're, mo you're moving slowly towards the right. question that Miriam posed. Okay. Um, but so all of, all of this, all of this uh, like trying to, trying, trying to grasp uh, these uh, descriptions at the most general level means that again, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm biting the bullet here, I'm, I'm trying to provide a um, as value-free discourse uh, as, as I can. So there is no, um, well, the question, the question of what we, we should do is secondary to the question of what we can do. Um, if, by definition, networks cannot be horizontal in the sense of fully flat, then horizontality is a regulative idea that you work towards, but it, it cannot be uh, a descriptive term. It doesn't actually describe um, anything, which doesn't mean that it doesn't come in degrees. You have structures that are, or networks that are more horizontal or, or less horizontal, and ideally you should work towards horizontality, although you're never going to eliminate the existence of hubs. And more importantly, hubs are necessary in two senses. First, they are, as far as we know, as far as our mathematical knowledge of networks indicates, they are mathematically necessary. They always develop in, in a network, so no point fighting that. Um, <laughs> We, we already have enough problems as it is in the left to start fighting mathematical necessities yeah, as well. So yeah, um, but um, secondly, they are necessary in the sense that they are the, the infrastructure that allows a very large network to communicate because it's only because it's, it's the hubs that hold the network together because they can route more traffic than anyone else. So, you know, uh, say the, the, um, our postal system, for example, you know, there'll, there'll be, um, rather than uh, mail being directed to several different places in, in Berlin all at once, it's directed to one central office and then from that central office to local offices and, and so on. And it's because of the existence of the central office, of the local office, that the, the, the system can function far more effectively. Um, this leads us to, to the thing, and I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I've taken, it's great that Miriam has taken on the job to be concrete, because I ended up taking on the job of being uh, too, too abstract. I promise you. a new position for you. Yeah, right. Um, I, promise, I promise you that uh, there are such things as examples and stuff in the, in the book. If you if you read it, um, but um, but I, I I think the point about um, Miran's points, both the point about the the synchronization of different layers, this is this is very uh, important, including the mass media layer, um, and the idea of, of the. the the problem is, perhaps you see this more clearly with Occupy, um, people mistook the beginning of the organizing process for the revolution. Occupy created a network system. This is why it hasn't dissipated. Occupy maybe as the occupation has dissipated, but for example, the network system created by Occupy could organize Occupy Sandy right after uh, the superstorm in New York and provide uh, disaster relief that was quicker and more effective than, than the local government in, in New York. But people mistook the revolution for the, the organizing process and it's very uh, likely that as the organizing process uh, evolves, well it's certainly the case that as the organizing process evolves, um, organizing on the ground is going to become far more important than, 
presence on on social media. So I totally agree with with your point there. Um, and the reason why some people would be some activists now would be very uh, angry or upset at the over stressing of the importance of of social media, and at the same time they could lead towards uh, a stabilization of the of the system. So progressively the the system the possibility of new leader new uh, or vanguard functions appearing decreases and the system becomes stabilized so um, stable leaderships start uh, appearing which can take the form of traditional organizations can take the form of influence uh, influential individuals etc a quick response because then I want to go back to the audience for a few more questions before we have a closing round up here yeah, I think that's really uh, interesting. I think this tie, uh, it re um, brings back something. The original question also was more about how does the current, how does the internet change the way we understand political praxis? And I think that's a very, very important question that we haven't yet um, grappled with. And I think that, that what you said reminds me of what I wanted to say before was, I see what we're discussing as, you know, I consider we're in a cap I consider we are talking from and experiencing these development developments in a capitalist system. I, I don't think we are post capitalism or, or informal immaterial um, that we have parallel parallel realities that create informal or immaterial or cognitive power or or, or uh, or economies like, like some of the people argued on, on networks and, and internet activism. Uh, I, I think capitalism is still a hegemonic force, and that means that the power of capitalism to co-opt is extremely uh, important. And I think what you mentioned about Occupy, but what you can also mention about some of the vanguard uh, actors uh, in the Facebook networks, or as Paolo um, Gabardo calls them, the choreographers of, of the movement, the sort of semi-leaders, they become, they are not involved necessarily, which is a good thing, as radical leftists or socialists or what have you, but, you know, are part of that network. So they are also more susceptible to be co-opted. So what you see is, what I found incredible is that not even two years after Occupy, I think, some of the people, the initiate, initiators in the Occupy group, have become so co-opted to the extent that Occupy Wall Street, the website, became a commercial enterprise. Um, Mika or Mika, or however you call, uh, pronounce his name, goes around selling the idea that he created the revolutions in the Arab world and Occupy Wall Street and is selling his labor for capitalist you know, <laughs> companies, etc. Some of the people in the Facebook revolution um, narrative, like actually they were already criticized by leftists in the beginning, but Wa'al Ghanem, who was the Google uh, uh, manager or whatever in, uh, in the Middle East, who was also described as the initiator of the Arab Revolution and, and, and Facebook icon, not only co-opted after the revolution, actually during the, 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 the uh, January, February uprising. So I think that would be an important uh, answer or sign, like what does it mean in a time like this to have internet being a force of change, to say the, time, the times we're in are actually capitalist times with ever more power to co-opt, because the internet is a, a, a tool, is a mechanism at the heart of capitalist exploitation. It is the most important financial sector. The ICT sector is more imp important than other manufacturing sectors nowadays. That's, po the post the, that, that's your postmodern globalization reality. What does it mean that the ICT, the producer of these things that we're talking about, is at the heart of our system? And what does it mean that the internet is also at the heart of empire. What does it mean? Those questions, I think, would be more interesting for me. It means that it's actually more difficult to be an activist and use the internet 
in a time like this than it was in another time to use another mediator, which was less susceptible to control and, and cooptation. Um, the fact that I am using tools, as someone said, that are part of power mechanisms that I can't avoid, means that I'm more vulnerable. And that explains, I think, why it was so easy, for instance, for the Syrian dictatorship to use the internet very swiftly uh, in a manner against activists, where, even though the activists started it as against the regime. The fact that they own the infrastructure, that they are able to import surveillance mechanisms uh, on the free market, that they are able to uh, allow uh, the surveillance uh, teams to set up the Syrian electronic army, it means something for us as critical uh, researchers. It, this was not possible in the same way with the printing press in previous revolutions. It was not possible in the same way with other mediations. There's something very important with this con contemporary mediation of the internet. Um, I, I tend to be uh, negative or, or I, tend, I tend to sound like I'm focusing more on the bad implications, but that's where I'm coming from now. Uh, that's, that's the phase I think that is sort of imposing this now. That would be the difference. I think that would be my answer. Like, what does it mean? It means that it's part of a system that is still uh, dominant, uh, more than other mediations were, more than the radio was, more than the printing press was, more than posters were, more than graffiti is, more than other forms of political expression and organization. I'm sorry if it's, <laughs> no, <laughs> if it's I, not the, uh, you know. Clearly your perspective is also very strongly shaped by the, by the cycle of struggles that you have participated in and researched, which has taken a rather, mm. you know, dark turn over the last year or two. So, but before we have sort of, although this in a way would have been a rousing closing statement. Um, so I'll shut up. No, 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 please. That's why, I mean, I, I'm really glad that this, I, I would have liked more people here because I think this has worked out very well, the abstract theorist and the, and the empirically, but theoretically, but theoret no, um, theoretically informed, nonetheless empirical researcher. So, before I pass back to the podium for a, a closing statement for which you both will have two or three minutes, um, which is fun. Um, I just wanted to sort of point to two notions that I thought were, were, I thought the notion of synchronization, which you used quite centrally, connects sort of also well to the notion of that there's actually a transversal network logic that, that structures both on and offline interaction. I, I do use synchronization as well, though not exactly in the same way. And, I'll start um, using it in Miriam's way now. And um, well, so, so sort of given the questions from the floor and this, this, this sense that I think there's actually an interesting convergence between your respective analyses. Um, I'll first give the word to Rodrigo mm -hmm. for a brief, for some brief closing comments. I know, I know. And then, and then I'll give the final word to, to Miriam. Um, no, I think um, I, I apologize if, if that was uh, the impression you got. You, you, ha you must take into account that Taju and I know each other for a long time and we've had like this this joke dynamic between us for a long time. Um, I think actually now towards towards the end and this is the great thing about this panel uh, has been the great thing about this panel for me is that it I think it becomes a lot clearer like what the the empirical uh, and theoretical word, work that needs to be done is to avoid precisely the kinds of accounts that Miriam has been criticizing since, since the start. And, and, if, and I think we must, in, in relation to this, we must take into consideration also the fact that she's, uh, at the moment she's working mostly on uh, the, the, the Middle East and Northern Africa because we could also consider the, what you could call the success so far, the success story of the uprisings of, of, the, of the last years, which is the one I know best, which is the case of Spain. And one of the, one of the things I, I think make, uh, makes a big difference in Spain is how much of an activist infrastructure already existed and how much this... Uh, activist infrastructure uh, meant 
the um, uh, say the daily uh, working towards uh, different uh, a different a different sociability than uh, capitalist sociability. The, the 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 thing that Miriam was pointing that, pointing out about how easy it is to co-opt these um, uh, Twitter celebrities is has to do precisely with the fact that if you're on Twitter as an individual, you're doing precisely what the platform is supposed to do, which is to promote yourself, to to sell yourself to whoever is gonna uh, might come and and buy you at some point. And that is very different to having, uh, on the one hand, collective accounts, which is something that's been very uh, common since the start in, in Spain, but also having structures like, I don't know if, they would have actually been really, a, a, a really interesting, really interesting people to invite to, to this uh, event. I don't know if you've heard about the PA, uh, plataforma por los afectados, pa plataforma de los afectados por la hipoteca. If you'd been around for this event. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they were here. Oh, well, well done. <laughs> well done, then you invited them. Um, yeah, which is, you know, this is actually very uh, ground, gra grassroots organizing. This, this has been, they have an important internet, Facebook, mass media, uh, presence, but this is mostly an amazing work of grassroots uh, organizing that's been done over the last few years that's achieved massive uh, social legitimacy in, in Spain. And I think that points, you know, in a very tentative uh, way, you could, that points to another dimension of, of the work uh, that needs to be done. As I said, I see these uprisings of recent years not as failed revolutions, but actually the, the potential beginning of an organizing process after years of um, decline in organization for all the reasons we know uh, very well. One of the places in which perhaps the situation was more propitious uh, and it worked out better was Spain, obviously Spanish people in Spain are up against uh, a lot less in political terms than they are in, in the, the Maghreb and, uh, and the Mashrek. Um, but yeah, this is so finally after, after a few, after a couple of hours discussing the internet, we get back to like where this could connect with uh, a a project of transformation, which is the title of this event, and the word I'm going to add. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, apologies if we uh, seem to be the typical uh, representation of the theory and practice. Uh, yeah. I think that was just uh, um, unfortunate, although I, I must say, I mean, it, it's not um, unique. Um, for anthropologists, <laughs> um, I think it's, it's, it's some, it somehow it summarizes uh, uh, um, uh, a lot, not just so much of this debate and this meeting here, but the debate in general, in, in the sense of there's so many false dichotomies uh, that are exhausting and tiring and that you have to overcome um, for the sake of, uh, you know, true empirical, uh, production of knowledge, but also for a useful sense of uh, understanding so that we can do something with. So these false dichotomies we already discussed in terms of the online, offline. Um, and I think you gave a good reflection on how the networks themselves are representing both. And, and we should move away from those false dichotomies. But there's also this false dichotomy of theory and practice, of course. I mean, I think I'm a Gramscian, and I understand that uh, both are connected in a um, in a dialectical way, uh, the prism of your um, analysis can be different, and that's very fine. The prism of my understanding is very ethnographically based, and the prism of someone else's understanding could be very theoretically or philosophically based. 
And I hope that I can actually collaborate with Rodriguez at some point, because I think we will find um, ways to challenge and, uh, and, and learn from each other. Um, it's obviously difficult to wrap up in one sentence. I would say I wrote a piece with Anne Alexander uh, called The Sense and Nonsense of the Facebook Revolution uh, two, two years ago, three years ago. And a recent and a follow-up on that one uh, last year, because we felt that even what we were saying three years ago, we had to really correct some of our positions and, and, and claims. Um, so the last piece was uh, called Egypt's, Egypt's Unfinished Revolution. Um, the, I think the other false dichotomy that is much more interesting in terms of sort of critical, uh, critical theory is that between, uh, and I think that's if I, as a Marxist, I could say, as Marxists, we have a lot to offer. And that is a false dichotomy between um, technology as a libera liberator or an oppressor. And that's, uh, again, something that we can critically um, tackle by bringing some of our knowledge about how dialectics works and how what you know mediation means. Uh, I, I mean, when I talk about mediation, uh, I found incredibly helpful the literature by, you know, Terry Eagleton, um, um, but uh, uh, even older uh, stuff. Um, Trotsky's work on art and literature, the way that, you know, those things have a certain autonomy in themselves, but they are mediated in a particular system, which then raises new questions. If your level of autonomy uh, is is there, you need to also understand how it's mediated in a capitalist context. And that is, I think, what I find really interesting in terms of um, moving away from this, is it liberating, or is it autonomous, or is it oppressive? Um, what I try to say in terms of my work on Syria is that what it shows is that activists are obliged and forced to maneuver. It's a politics of maneuvering. You have to maneuver between the oppressive and liberatory implications and, and um, uh, uh, practices that the internet offer. Um, and I think that what it shows is that when you come to a certain point where people decide that um, doing, uh, uh, doing something, although very risky, or uh, outweighs the risk of doing nothing, as we've seen in Syria very clearly, that's when the maneuvering becomes a, a question of uh, 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 tactics. And what you see is that activists choose then explicitly to use those platforms that are very dangerous to them because it allows the oppressor to find them even quicker and, and, uh, and better, because that's the infrastructure of that platform. It wasn't catered for activists, it was catered for companies to identify you as a consumer. So if that means that Bashar al-Assad is able to find that activist because that activist uses Facebook, the question is why do those activists then still use it? And I think that shows that they have decided that the risk of using it with the potential, not guaranteed, potential aim of actually reaching out to a mass of outweighs it. And that's what I suggest could be a way to analyze the moment we're in as activism, as a maneuvering practice. And that comes to the final point then. What does it mean? How, what can we offer? I think we've come to a stage now where we have to have really critical debates and workshops for activists, how to better use the internet in a safe way. The whole idea of proxies and the whole idea of, you know, Tor and the whole, you know, the whole debate that is surrounded around hacktivists now. This know-how, this expertise that hacktivists have. The smart geeks who can allow you to avoid censorship. We have to break out of that circle of hacktivism and make it common knowledge for activists who are not hacktivists so that they can uh, use those mechanisms. I think that's where the point we're at now where we're saying you cannot have hacker camps anymore 
in the woods. It's really nice to have, drink your mate and your vegan uh, dinner in the woods somewhere. You need to have your hacker conferences in the urban working class settings where activists are actually um, working and engaging so that they can also learn how to avoid. Uh, everybody should be anonymous. Everybody should be. Uh, I think that's the, the point. Um, and yeah, the parameters of our debates, the, the, the parameters of our knowledge, it's, it's so incredibly Euro-American. It's very hard to counter it. it um, uh, but uh, I think I've given up on that. Um, it's not just a matter of, you know, it's much worse in the third world. It's really also a matter of epistemological deconstruction because it says something about balance of forces. And I don't believe that it's a matter of being more successful in another context. I think also the indignados. I think also Spain, Europe in general show internal class differences that are really sharp that are just as important as the differences between Europe and the Arab world. Um, so I think we also need to have that sort of um, correction uh, that it doesn't mean that because you are not being shot at, although you sometimes do get shot at in Europe, just because you're not being massacred on a high scale, that, that the way you use the internet is fundamentally more secure or, or better. And uh, I want to learn from that as well, uh, so that I can also bring that in back to my work on the Arab world. Um, yeah, I wish I could have said something really optimistic and, and thrilling and thriving, <laughs> but... Uh... There's, still no, there, there's, there's still time, but not on this panel, but maybe in the rest of the conference. Um, I, I, would have, I would have quoted once again our friend Harry Halpin quoting Anonymous. Knowledge is free, we are anonymous, we are legion, we don't forgive, we don't forget, be expecting us. So thank you very much for being here. We'll be expecting more debate and um, enjoy lunch. No, thank you very much and thank you and thank you for the translation. And for the discussion.